we're seeking to saturate our minds, our souls with the truths of Romans chapter number eight. The book of Romans is written to believers, as are the other New Testament epistles. People who have come face to face with the gospel and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, among those believers, there are professing believers. And so when these churches received these testimonies of truth from the apostles, part of what was going on is there was an examination of individual faith. Another part of what's going on is a seeking to clarify the realities of the gospel. Another aspect of Paul's writings to the believers at Rome was to defend God's mercy to the Gentiles. The gospel was to go to the Jews and then through the Jews to the world. It was a bit of a transition that took place as we read in the book of Acts where there was a challenge about the difference between Jews and Gentiles, the Jews having full exposure to the Old Covenant, the Gentiles being included in that Abrahamic promise, God's covenant with Abraham, to create a people and to give them a land and to grant to them the truth, the revelation of God, and then through them, to bring people into a relationship with God, to advance uh, the gospel uh, into all of the world. This is the great commission of the apostles. And now as they write to the church in these epistles, they're seeking to help us to understand, to clarify our thinking. So when we pick up the book of Romans and the book of Ephesians and the book of Galatians, and even scattered through the other New Testament epistles, we have an emphasis on the good news, the gospel. Many times people limit the good news to the idea of being saved from hell. But what Paul wants us to understand is that uh, salvation, regeneration, the new birth is not the culmination uh, of spiritual life. It's really the beginning. It's the commencement of spiritual life. And when this is misunderstood, we have a majority possibly of believing people that think everything is settled and done because they have trusted Christ. And yet what Paul wants us to understand is God's ultimate purpose was not simply to deliver us from hell but to conform us to the image of his son. And part of the false teaching that Paul warns about and part of the false belief system of uh, many who profess Christ is the idea that all God is doing is rescuing people and delivering people uh, from the judgment of hell. But actually he is working in believers' lives to move them further and further along in this restored relationship with God. He's really, uh, in a sense, recreating paradise uh, in the heart and life of believers and in, in allowing us to walk with him, allowing us to commune with him, affording us the privilege of being image bearers who live out our lives in his likeness. So we're returning to Romans chapter eight, Romans 8 gives us a testimony to the ministry of God's Spirit in the life of the believer. The saving work of the indwelling Spirit of Christ. The provision of the Holy Spirit in producing holy saints. And we have a testimony to the Spirit of God. We have a testimony to the Spirit of Christ. We have a testimony to the Holy Spirit. The triune God is spoken of in terms of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that is holy in character and impact. In Romans chapter 8, this is the resident Holy Spirit who changes who we are, a change that otherwise could never take place. We must not forget this with exaggerations about the Holy Spirit and misuse uh, 
regards to the Holy Spirit as to some kind of power that is uh, at our disposal, at our command. Um, even as we see this and we have to deal with this, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is a gracious gift of God. Not to be misunderstood and misused, but neither to be ignored. And when we think in terms of this conformity to Christ, this ultimate purpose of God in his eternal saving purpose, that includes the resident Holy Spirit who changes who we are, a change that otherwise could never take place. Now, we're continuing our study of holiness, and Romans chapter 8 is a big part of that, really the culmination of this study. Well, this is the hope of every believer. Not only that the, the penal penalty would be paid, that is that the debt, the wage would be paid, but also that the impact of sin uh, would be addressed, that the uh, damage done in our lives would be addressed. And God does this through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 1 reads, There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now this is a promise, no condemnation, but it's also a fact. There is, Paul says, for us in Christ, no condemnation. It's a good way to think about it. There is for us in Christ, no condemnation. Paul indicates that a change has taken place in every believer. And that change will never change. A change has taken place in every believer. And that change will never change. It'll never be undone. This is a statement of truth intended to secure us in our standing with God, but also intended to strengthen us in our walk before God. Specifically, when we are keenly aware of our failure, when we're keenly aware that we're worthy of condemnation, we need to be reminded that there is therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. This is a statement of truth to secure us in our standing with God and strengthen us in our walk before God. This standing of security and this promise of strength is possible to all who are in Christ and who have the Spirit of Christ in them. This standing of security, this promise of strength is possible to all who are in Christ and who have the Spirit of Christ in them. Now, God's part is a full provision, a communication of his grace and peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, Romans 5.1. God's part is full provision. But what about our part? Well, our part is active faith act of faith. We must trust what has been declared. God speaks here through Paul of a relational union that has been initiated by God and that has been carried out by God and that is offered to whosoever believeth. It's a relational union that's initiated by God and carried out by God and offered to whosoever believeth, and it is effective in reconciling the sinner to God. No condemnation. It's effective in reconciling the sinner to God, but also in working holiness into his or her life. At the same time, promising ultimate holiness in his presence forever. There's Romans 8. A relational union initiated by God and carried out by God, offered to whosoever believeth, and effective in reconciling the sinner to God 
and working holiness into his or her life while promising ultimate holiness in his presence forever. Romans 8 begins with no condemnation and it ends with no separation. The believers no condemnation status. This positional holiness before God. Justification in answer to the righteous demands of holy God. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. In answer to the righteous demands of holy God and his law. In answer to the helpless inability of man to fulfill God's law. In answer to the law's lifelessness or impotence to help man in his flesh. And in answer to the condemnation that comes from these realities, God himself has declared righteous all who will trust him. He's answering the righteous demands of his holy law. He's answering the helpless, impotent inability of man to fulfill his holy law. He's answering the law's lifelessness to help man in his flesh. And he's answering the condemnation that comes from these reality realities. He declares righteous all those who will trust him, all of those who will trust in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. God regards me as his child because of the work of his son. God imputes to me his own righteousness through Jesus Christ. For someone to be in Christ Jesus in Pauline terms means being into Christ Jesus. The picture here is that we were outside of Christ and now we are inside of Christ. To be in Christ Jesus is to be into Christ Jesus. We were outside of Christ and now we are inside of Christ. We have been mystically united with Christ. And that union is eternally inseparable. There is therefore now a dynamic change has taken place. A dynamic change has taken place. Provision and promise, no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Later on in our text, we're going to be reminded that we are not debtors to this flesh. We are owned. We belong to God. Provision and promise, ownership and obligation. First of all, a dynamic change has taken place. If you're a believer today, at some point in time, you had an experience. It's referred to as conversion. You were outside of Christ. And now you are into Christ. The holy law of God revealed your rebellion. And it also revealed your human inability. But the holy son of God provided for God's righteous demands. And the holy judge of heaven declared you as one that is believing just, justified. So here, no condemnation, no judgment. The idea of judgment is the idea of evaluation. Evaluation or examination. No condemnation is a new verdict. A new verdict. It's a new conclusion made by God based upon the fact that you who are outside of Christ are, came into Christ. You are now in Christ. The believing have been delivered through union with Christ. It's not judgment escaped as if it has been circumvented. It's not that God turned away and decided not to judge sin. It's rather that the judgment has been satisfied through Christ. There's a big difference. It's to them which are in Christ Jesus. It's not that God ignored the sin 
as if it didn't matter. Rather, he paid for the sin and he removed from the record the condemnation, the judgment against us. See, this is the beginning of Paul's point as he instructs regarding the Holy Spirit's work in chapter 8. This is the beginning point of Paul's instruction regarding the work of the Holy Spirit. Penal servitude to the law is no longer our state. In the last part of verse 1, as well as the last part of verse number 4, it talks about the fact that th these are those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those that have been pardoned, those that have been set free, those that have been set free from a flesh existence, those that have been indwelt by the Spirit of Christ to walk in newness of life. They walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse number 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me, Paul makes this personal, free from the law of sin and death. There's a new law, there's a new presence, there's new life. This is a reference to the overpowering spirit of Christ within every believer. We now live outside the realm of law condemnation to be positionally in Christ as a result of union with Christ in his life and death and his return to life is what Paul is referencing. He talks about it in chapter 6 in the first 11 verses. He speaks in Romans about being in Christ versus being in Adam. He speaks in terms of new birth, the regenerating power and work of God's Spirit in our lives. Look at verse number three. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now, Paul uses the word flesh in three different ways. He writes of flesh in some places as literal f flesh, physical flesh. When he talks about circumcision, circumcision, he's talking about in the physical realm. He also speaks of flesh in terms of kinsman flesh. When he speaks of his people, the Jews, according to the flesh, he talks about his human relationship with other Jews. So there's the physical aspect. There's the national racial aspect of flesh. But here he's speaking of our human nature, our fallen nature. When we were dominated by, by the desires of that which was sinful, one writer calls it the lower side, the lower side of man's nature. And that fits with what Paul does in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 19 to 21, where he demonstrates what the flesh looks like in contrast to the spirit. We might call it the self, the self life, the self life. Well, here, Paul's talking about our inability to keep God's law being met by the incarnate Son's intervention. Our impossible situation and His condescending grace. Impotence is met with omnipotence, we might say. Grace, God's condescending grace. Our impotence is met with His omnipotence. He addresses our inability. He addresses our utter desperation. And he imputes our sin to Jesus Christ and imputes Christ's righteousness to us. So Christ became like sinful humanity with the exception of sin, with the exception of he had no participation in original sin. His virgin birth is a testimony to that. Nor did he commit any sin. So follow what is being said here for verse number three, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The flesh could never accomplish, could never fulfill God's holy law. Well, what we could never do, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Notice the word likeness there. It wasn't in, in Adam's line in regards to a sinful nature. And for sin speaks of his atonement and his offering. He condemned sin in the flesh. 
He judged sin through his cross death. He paid our debt. He condemned that which condemned us, we might say. And thus he can say to us, there's no condemnation. He condemned that which condemned us, thus communicating to us here, no condemnation. Verse number four, why did he do that? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. A dynamic change has taken place. The believing have been delivered through, through union with Christ, into Christ. Penal servitude to the law is no longer our state, trying to fulfill God's righteous demands in the energy of our flesh and being condemned by that law. That's not where we are anymore. We live in a no condemnation state. But thirdly, a God honoring righteousness is now possible through the indwelling spirit. See, we are law keepers by design. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean, in paradise, Adam and Eve lived out the rule of God over their lives until the fall. We are law keepers by design. You know, believers are law keepers by desire, according to Paul. We, des we delight in doing what's right. The psalmist speaks of this often. Paul, even in chapter 7 of Romans, is talking about how he longed to do what was right. We're law keepers by design, and we're law keepers by desire as believers, finding delight in doing what's right. Why would we find delight in doing what's right? Because of a dynamic change that is taking place. Taking place. We've been delivered through union with Christ. We've been redeemed. The just demands of the law have been satisfied by Christ. And the holy standard of God, the God of eternity, can now be lived out in our lives because of his presence and because of his power. Now, we need to be reminded in application that no condemnation does not mean no conviction. The righteous requirements are fully met. The penalty has been paid. And the Holy Spirit has been granted to to seal us, to indwell us, to minister to us, but we will still be convicted. So not, no condemnation does not mean no conviction to say, well, why do I feel conviction if I'm not condemned? Because you and I still sin. We have not been completely redeemed in the sense that we've been removed from the presence of sin. The penalty has been addressed and the power has been addressed, but as we live this life, we fail. There's Paul's struggle in Romans 7. There's our struggle. And this is part of what gets people downtrodden in their minds because they say, well, if I'm a Christian and, and the Holy Spirit's in me and I desire to do what's right, why do I keep failing? I think one of the reasons Paul is writing this, don't you think, is because of the old wretched man that I am in chapter 7. So an application, no condemnation does not mean no conviction. Secondly, no condemnation does not promise earth side perfection. See, this old man, new man struggle continues throughout life. The natural man, the supernatural man remain in conflict. And Paul is reassuring us that our standing is settled and that the potential for triumph is a reality because of God's presence in our life through his indwelling spirit. We will fail, but we will not be disowned or discarded. We will struggle, but we will not be cast off, and we should not live cast down. We will, due to the Holy Spirit's influence, fulfill righteousness in the way that we live. This will be our new pattern. On well, verse 5, Paul advances with his instruction some doctrinal realities. We might say some explanation. Four, verse number five says, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. He puts before us two classes of men that are living contrastive lives. First, he talks about the 
unbeliever, the one who lives after the flesh, and that's the only way he can live, the natural man desires rule in the unbeliever's life. Those desires, those appetites, those yearnings, those longings. See, if we're after the flesh, if we're unbelieving, we mind the things of the flesh. Well, what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives? Here's the contrast. Second part of verse 5, they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The desires, the appetites, the yearnings, the longings have changed. Instead of a flesh-dominated life, we live a spirit-dominated life. This is God's plan. A mentality, a mindset, we might say. So secondly, we not only can say that a dynamic change has taken place, but we can say, and hear Paul saying, that a directional influence has taken over the Holy Spirit. Before it was the flesh that motivated us. It was the flesh that dictated our desires and appetites and yearnings and longings. Now it's the spirit. There's a new hub. There's a new hub. There's a new control center, a spiritual mindedness. Always we are people who desire life and peace. And he's saying to us here, that that is what is provided through the ministry of the Spirit. Notice it in verse number six, for to be carnally minded, another way of talking about the flesh, is death. It brings death. The end of its death, the end of its separation from God. But to be spiritually minded, notice, is life and peace. See, life and peace is what everybody's striving for. Life and peace is what drives man to do what he does. And so God's answer to that desire for life and peace in verse number six is the ministry of God's Holy Spirit, a spiritual mindedness. See, the Holy Spirit does not force his way, but forges a new path. In verse number four, Paul talks about the need to walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's a choice in the faith race. That's a pattern of life long term. And then talking about minding in verses five and six, minding the things of the flesh, minding the things of the spirit. Verse six, carnally minded. Verse six, spiritually minded. What are we talking about? We're talking about an understanding Spiritual mindedness has to do with understanding, has to do with direction, has to do with that which we're striving after. The mind is where we process, it's where we take in information. The mind would include as well, in this case, our will, our heart, whether mind in the flesh or mind in the spirit. And this pattern of thought and motive, our interest and aims, when we're minding the flesh, it leads to death. It leads to separation from God. What dominates our inner man and drives our outer man is what Paul's talking about. The Holy Spirit does not force his way, but forges a new path. God calls us to faith. Secondly, holy living is always the result of holy desires and, don't miss this, determinations. We're told to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Holy living is always the result of holy desires and determinations. Verse number six, he's speaking about the carnal versus the spiritual. He's speaking of death versus life and peace, separation from God versus power and blessing. And then in verse seven, because the carnal mind is enmity, against God. There's hostility, carnal mindedness. The carnal mind is hostile toward God, for it is not subject to the law of God. It's not only hostility, but there's inability. Neither can be. A carnal mind cannot be subject to the holy law of God. You cannot live a God-pleasing, righteous, holy life because of the hostility. So in verse 7, we got hostility and inability. Verse number 8. So then, here's the conclusion, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. God's pleasure. There's a holy displeasure. There can't be peace. There's hostility here. 
But, verse number nine says to the believer, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He brings all of this together. The battle continues, though triumph is evident. And Paul is addressing that. This is what he's been getting at. Verse number 10, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Okay, The reality is that death is evident in all of us. Decay. We will die. Barring the return of Christ, we will die. But, second part of verse 10, the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, Paul says, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He looks forward. The spirit of God dominates, permeates our motives, addresses our inmost desires and changes them. It doesn't change the fact that we've died, that we're dead. <laughs> in the sense of that attachment to first to that first Adam, or that we are dying. But that old master does not dominate the life of a believer because we have risen to life in the second Adam, the last Adam. Subduing and overcoming and ruling over and defeating and conquering sin in us, God and cannot compromise his holiness in, rec in rescuing us. So no condemnation comes through Christ condemning sin in the flesh. Holy living is produced only by the life-giving Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, he says, then you're not his child. God cannot compromise his holiness in rescuing us. God does not accommodate our unrighteousness, but he changes us, he gives us a new heart. He gives us new desires. He grants us a new hope. He grants us a new direction. All of this gives testimony to new life in Christ. And all of this is part of what Paul is saying here. There's a new domination. There's a new dominion. There's a new kingdom ruling over our lives. God cannot compromise his holiness in rescuing us. The no condemnation is because he condemned sin in Christ. God does not accommodate our unrighteousness. He changes us. See, grace is not abounding that sin might abound. He's already addressed that. Now, God does not leave us as we are, but he moves us forward cultivating and nurturing in us the Christ life as we draw near to him. It's a Christ in us. It's us in Christ. It's resurrection life. It's resurrection power within the believer. It's eternal resurrection life in a resurrected body that is promised to us. Our flesh speaks of when all of our thinking and speaking and action revolves around us. But the spirit, heavenly thinking, has to do with our speaking and action revolving around Christ. See, the Holy Spirit is doing in us what he has done for us. He's made us holy and he's making us holy as the hub of life changes from self to Christ, we live by the spirit rather than by the flesh. What is the active principle of righteousness then? Well, it's God's Holy Spirit living in us. What is the assuring presence of righteous standing? The same, it's God's spirit living in us. All of this God has done. We're not doomed to death. Our bodies will die, but they will not stay in the grave. And we will be granted new bodies fitted for eternal glory so that we might forever live for God's pleasure. What about our responsibility? There's appalling shift here. There's an application here in verse number 12. 
It's introduced by that word again, therefore. Therefore, he says in verse 12, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. He starts it with a negative statement. Provision and promise. Let's look at ownership and obligation. Privilege comes with responsibility. There is the potential for failing. But the obligation as to who we serve, it's clear we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. He goes on in verse number 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. One course or the other, there's a positional and practical application here. Those who live only according to the flesh, those that are unbelieving, will end in separation from God. But practically speaking, even those who are believing and follow after the flesh, while they won't be eternally separated from God, they'll live lives of separation from God. This is a warning to both the believing and the unbelieving. Change will be evident. Consequences are sure. If you live after the flesh, you'll die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And that's possible because of the Spirit. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The emphasis is clear. Paul is saying authentic Christianity looks like this. There is one master and there are those that serve him that live after the Spirit. Verse 15, ye have not received the spirit of bondage again into fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Here's assurance for us. He makes us his children. He assures us of sonship. This is a present reality that has a future realization, this idea of adoption. It's a present reality that has a future realization. Crying Abba Father is a term of endearment, and it may very well be those quiet whispers of, I, I know I'm your child, I can talk to you as my father. It may as well be those desperate cries when we have failed him or we feel condemned and we, we cry out, Abba Father, Abba Father, you are my father, you are my help. It's a statement of security even in the midst of turmoil and challenge. Verse number 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. See, it's his assurance. It's his assurance. And verse 17, and if children, then heirs. See, there's that future realization. Then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Whatever Christ gets, we get because we are in Christ into Christ, placed in Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And Paul's going to go on and expand upon that in verses 18 and following. And we'll look at that next time. God cannot compromise his holiness in rescuing us. There's no condemnation because he condemned sin in Christ. And God does not accommodate our unrighteousness, but changes us. He brings his spirit to live in us and change us. Thirdly, God does not leave us as we are, but he moves us forward. So directional influence has taken over. And lastly, God will not abandon us because he owns us as his own. Spirit of adoption, spirit of Christ bearing witness with our spirit that we're the children of God and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Provision and promise, ownership and obligation. What a privilege it is to call God our heavenly father. Let's pray to him. Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. May it permeate our hearts. May it saturate our minds. May it feed us today. May it sustain us. May it strengthen us. May it secure us. May it be evident in our thinking, our attitudes, our words, our actions. May we not be satisfied to stay as we are. May we not as well 
become downturned because of our failure. But may we come back to texts like these and remember, be reminded what you've done, what you've promised, what you're doing, and how it is that we are to respond in faith. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.